Jesus was deeply troubled and testified, Amen, amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another at a loss to whom he meant. When Leonardo da Vinci came to the dining room of the monastery of Santa Maria della Grazia to paint a mural of the Last Supper, he chose to depict this specific moment. He chose the moment in the Gospel of John when Christ told his apostles, one of you will betray me. Now, the Last Supper in general is a common motif for dining room art. I hope the symbolism there is obvious. So the fact that Leonardo chose the Last Supper for this particular dining room is not revolutionary. But it was unique for Leonardo to choose this precise moment when Christ says, there is a traitor among you. Why this moment? To answer that question, we have to go behind the canvas. Okay, okay, it's not a canvas, it's a fresco, but roll with me here. Leonardo's Last Supper doesn't need much introduction. Most people have seen some version of it, and with the exception of the Mona Lisa, it's probably Leonardo's most famous work. Completed just before the turn of the 16th century, the Last Supper is a reactionary piece, at least in the very strict sense that it shows all of the Twelve Apostles reacting to Christ's declaration about the imminent betrayal. It's also one of the greatest masterpieces of Renaissance art, which emphasizes balance and symmetry in every composition. The most obvious symmetrical device present here is the use of linear perspective to create a sense of depth even on a two-dimensional surface. The ceiling of the upper room, the tiles on the floor, the tapestries on the walls, they all give us clear orthogonal lines that trace to a single vanishing point in the center. In this case, Jesus' head. And that vanishing point is also perfectly centered in the window behind Christ, which is flanked by two other windows of equal size. The painting is also very clearly delineated horizontally by the edge of the room's table. Now, aside from symmetry, this also helps Leonardo with the practical consideration of the doorway that interrupts his mural. The table is level, and its edge is straight as an arrow, but Leonardo disrupts this fine edge to show that the tablecloth has been folded before it was set. And those folds in turn make more orthogonal lines that give us depth. But all of that is just the setting for the scene. The balance and symmetry is also apparent in the apostles themselves. With Jesus, the group is separated into even fifths and all their heads are at a similar height. The apostles are arranged in four groups of three, with two groups on either side of Jesus. And here we start to unlock the drama of the moment. Each group of three responds to Jesus' proclamation differently. To Christ's far left, Matthew, Jude, and Simon the Zealot each respond to the declaration with confusion. They turn to each other for answers. Matthew and Jude turn straight to Simon, seeking answers. Simon shrugs, pointing open hands back to Christ. Beside them, the next three men show a righteous indignation. These are James the Greater, Thomas, and Philip. James has his hands spread wide, as if he's recoiling away from Christ's words. He is moving further away from Jesus, while his two companions move closer. Philip, meanwhile, leans across James, perhaps pleading for some explanation. Or perhaps his hands tell us that he is saying, Surely not I, Lord. I will not betray you. Thomas also leans in closer to Jesus, his hand pointed up in defiance. And some believe this motion is meant to foreshadow Thomas's eventual doubt after the resurrection. He cannot believe what Christ is telling him. Going now to the far side of the table, we see Nathaniel, James the Lesser, and Andrew. 
all three show surprise. Nathaniel shoots up from his seat, and we can almost hear his chair or his stool scraping on the floor and toppling over. Andrew has his hands up, as if the traitor that Christ spoke of were about to leap out at him. Between these two is the lesser James, who is the only one in the scene whose figure cuts across these groups of three. As James scrambles in his surprise, he reaches out for Peter, the leader of the apostles. Which brings us to the last group. Peter, John, and beneath them, the traitor himself, Judas Iscariot. This is the most dynamic of the groups, and with good reason. Here, each man responds in a unique way. John is the only apostle at the table who does not show any extreme emotion in this moment. Only his face and the face of Christ are fully visible to us, with everyone else at least in some level of profile or shadow. John alone has the demeanor of Christ. His eyes are down, he's looking sad, but ultimately he is serene and at peace. Likewise, in the morning to come, He alone among the apostles will be with Christ at Calvary. But in this moment, John is pulled away by the elder Peter. And here Leonardo depicts the conversation between the two. Peter the Rock asks John the Beloved to go to Christ and ask him to identify the traitor. All the apostles want to know. Peter decides to ask. And it is John who will recline over Christ's heart and ask him on behalf of the others. Peter's expression also displays his volatile temperament. He is angry, decisive, and in his offhand, he holds a knife. Now, a knife is a perfectly normal thing to have at table, but in this moment, it more clearly foreshadows the hours to come, when Peter will lash out at the high priest's servant in an attempt to defend his Lord. He will sever the man's ear, in defiance of Christ's own will. And last, of course, is Judas. His head is geometrically the lowest, and actually the closest to the audience, who must look up from below. Judas's figure is partly obscured by the painting's deterioration over time, but even without that fuzziness, we know that Judas's face is the one that was most obscured by the angles of the painting. Nowadays, Simon the Zealot looks a bit worse for wear, But in the original composition, it is only Judas who is difficult to see. He, and he alone, is turned fully away from us, obscured entirely in shadow. Despite this, Leonardo makes sure we can still understand his mind. In his right hand, Judas is grasping a purse. No doubt that purse holds the 30 pieces of silver for which Judas sold the life of the Son of God. Foolishly, this is now Judas's most prized possession, and he keeps it close to himself, under the pretense of being the group's treasurer. With his left hand, Judas is reaching for a bread or a dish. He's the only one in the group who hasn't abandoned the meal itself, as if part of him is trying to just act cool and just keep going as if nothing had happened. That, in turn, brings us to Jesus himself. Amid the general chaos of the scene, Christ is a presence of peace. Both symbolically and literally, he is at the center of this. His figure is arranged in an equilateral triangle, again underscoring the symmetry of the work, his head and hands forming its points. Jesus is reaching for the same dish as Judas, so that he can use that to identify the traitor to John. In addition, I wonder if this is meant to depict a sort of interior longing on Christ's part, as if he's trying to reach out to the wayward Judas spiritually, as if to say, it's not too late. You can still choose me. Take my hand and let me lead you. But Jesus knew Judas's choice. Despite this betrayal, Jesus has a face of serenity. He is sad but that grief does not manifest as anger or accusation or angst. Instead, it is a peaceful and humble surrender to the sacrifice to come. It is 
acceptance of the price for our sin. Christ's other hand and his eyes point to the bread on the Eucharistic table. His hand is open in an offering, giving the bread and laying open on the wood of the table which has become an altar. In a few hours, his hands will again be open to the nails of his tormentors as an offering upon the wood of the cross. So now that we have the details, why did Leonardo choose this moment? Certainly because there's a drama here that had been left unexplored by many artists before him, but also because like most worthwhile art, it is an open invitation. The room which descends into the background also expands towards the viewers, inviting us to enter prayerfully into this moment. How would we react in this moment? We should ask ourselves, how do we react now? How do we react to Christ when we ourselves are at the Eucharistic table? How do we react when Christ is before us? Are we zealous like St. James, St. Thomas, and St. Philip, flabbergasted by the idea that we would betray Christ? If there was a temptation for us to betray him, would we rush to him, ask for clarification, ask for help? Would we rush to declare anew our faith in him? How do we react when we are troubled? Do we react like the other James grasping at St. Peter the Rock? Do we ourselves turn to the church to shore up our faith and our uncertainties? How do we react when we are confused and in the dark? Do we do as St. Peter and St. John did, going straight away to Jesus with their questions? They didn't wait or seek human counsel first as some of the other apostles did. They went straight to the Lord. When we are shocked or frightened, do we trust in the presence of Christ as St. John does here? Do we turn to Christ's beloved saints for help and intercession as St. Peter does? Or, in contrast to all of this, do we react like Judas? We know our sins. Do we cling to them? Do we approach the Eucharistic table in spite of them, as if this is just any old meal with any old bread? As hard as Christ's words may seem, as challenging as his invitations often are, do we let them move us? Or do we sit, unchanging, even as Christ reaches out to save us.